so yes the week before last we finished the first five books that would be the torah so the first five books the torah uh, we have briefly looked at today we will begin with what are called the historical books uh, that would be joshua onwards so the aim is to at least look at three of the historical books today so uh, hopefully we will be able to cover joshua judges and also ruth so very briefly we will look at these three books so let's begin uh, if you can all you know keep your bibles open at the book of joshua uh, so that when i request you to read out any verses you know your bible will already be open it will make it easier for you to uh, read out any verses that need to be uh, covered so uh, the book of joshua as we know is mainly emphasizing the conquest of the promised land the new generation has now uh, is now going to enter the promised land and uh, the as long as they are faithful to the lord as long as they have his backing they will be able to gain victory uh, over all the territories that the lord is giving them so the book of joshua is mainly about conquering the promised land and once the land is conquered uh, we have some details given about which tribe was uh, placed in which uh, portion of the land so the distribution of the territory among the 12 tribes uh, that also is given so joshua is mainly about conquest and also the distribution of the inheritance which is now coming to them um, so we'll very briefly look at the structure of joshua and then maybe we can look at some one or two main aspects um, because we will not be able to cover more details due to lack of time so coming to the structure of joshua the first four chapters uh, we can say is one section um, in the first four chapters we see them crossing the jordan river to enter into the promised land so that is explained and once they enter into the promised land basically they enter at the place where jericho is situated so uh, the conquest of jericho is also uh, described in these first four chapters the second section we could say is chapters 5 to 12 um, in chapters 5 to 12 uh, we see the great victory which they have at jericho we also see the defeat which takes place at ai due to the sin of akan um and we also see in these chapters the blessings and curses which were supposed to be declared publicly if you remember uh it was in deuteronomy that moses says when you enter the land i want six of the tribes to stand on one mountain and i want the other six tribes to stand on the other mountain and loudly uh, the curses and the blessings will be called out and all the people will say yes we accept these um, covenant conditions which the lord has laid down so uh, moses had requested that once they enter the land they should do that so we see that happening in chapter 8 of joshua where we see the tribes standing on mount gerizim and mount ebal and uh, the blessings and the curses are uh, publicly declared and all the people say yes we shall follow the covenant and as long as we follow the lord may all these blessings come upon us but we know that if we fail to keep the covenant um, you know conditions which have been placed then yes the judgment of god would come upon us the curses which have been called out would come upon us so we uh, we see that in chapter 8 and just an interesting fact regarding these two mountains um even today tourists go there and uh, anyone who goes to the top of these two mountains can still hear what is being said down in the valley i mean of course they would not be able to hear the actual words of people speaking but they can hear the voices you know they can uh, so um something about the acoustics of these two mountains even when you're on the mountain you can hear what is being spoken um what is being done down in the valley and um, i just read somewhere that 
I mean, I'm not sure whether the school is there now, but there was supposed to be some school in the valley. And you can hear the children playing and calling out to each other from the top of, of these two mountains. So um, when six of the tribes would have stood on one mountain and the other six on the other mountain, and these uh, blessings and the curses are being loudly proclaimed you know, by the leaders, everyone would have heard very clearly what is being told. And then the people uh, agree and say, yes, we shall keep the covenant of the Lord. So the Lord chooses these two mountains to uh, have this declaration done. Uh, in chapter 10, yeah, in chapter 10, you will have uh, details about the uh, conquests in the southern region. In chapter 11, you have the conquests which were done in the northern region. So this uh, entire chunk, you know, chapter 5 up to chapter 12, will deal with all the different conquests. Um, in the southern campaign of chapter 10, is where you see the Gibeonites. They trick uh, Joshua into thinking that they are from another place. Uh, we covered this in one of the previous classes. We saw how in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God very clearly says that there are seven nations that he wants to bring judgment upon. So these seven nations are the ones that the Israelite people must defeat. They must destroy them completely and take over their lands because God says the time has now come for these seven nations to be judged. So um, the Gibeonites were part of these seven. You know, um, the seven uh, nations that are mentioned in Deuteronomy 7, uh, which deserve judgment, uh, among them you have the Amorites. So the Gibeonite people were one of the clans in the Amorite nation group. So the Gibeonites, they decide to trick Joshua. So they pretend that they have come from a far off land and they say, we want to make a treaty with you. If you have any trouble, we will come to you and help you. And if you are in trouble, you must come and help us. So they enter into a treaty. Joshua fails to consult the Lord. Without consulting the Lord, he assumes that they are what they are saying is true and he enters into a peace treaty with, with them. So which means now they cannot destroy the Gibeonites, even though they are among these seven nation groups that have been uh, mentioned. So, uh, and God holds them to their word. You know, once they have given their word that they will maintain peace with them, now they are forced to, they, they, they cannot back out of this. So we see that happening in chapter 10. And we also see the negative results of that. We will talk about it a little bit later. Uh, so that would be chapter 10. Uh, chapter 11 uh, is where it talks about the conquests in the northern uh, region. Uh, so this is the second section, chapters 5 to 12. Uh, chapters 13 to 24 is where you have all the details about how the land was divided among these 12 tribes. Uh, and it also gives us details about the six cities of refuge which God selected um, in in this uh, in this in these territories. So we learn that two and a half tribes choose to stay on the east side of the Jordan River, and then the rest of the tribes they settle down on the western side of the Jordan River. Uh, so uh, the two and a half tribes which you have on the eastern side of the Jordan would be your Reuben, Gad, and uh, Manasseh, the half-tribe of Manasseh. So these uh, settle on the eastern side of the Jordan. And so three cities of refuge are selected on the eastern side. And then you have another three cities of refuge on the western side. If we have time at all, maybe we can look at a few details regarding what exactly are the cities of refuge uh, and all of that. And then you have finally chapter 24, the last chapter, where you have uh, Joshua's speech. You have his declaration where he says, you know, as for me and my house, uh, we will serve the Lord. Now, all of you have to personally decide what you are going to do. We all have declared uh, on, the, on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. We have declared and said that, yes, we will follow the Lord. Now it's a choice that you all have to make with your families on a 
day to day basis so um, he gives his concluding speech in chapter 24 that is your basic brief structure of the uh, book of joshua uh, coming to some of the incidents which take place uh, we don't have much time so we will just cover whatever little bit that we can uh, maybe we can turn uh, in our uh, yeah there's a question here go ahead yes chapter 1 to 2 chapters 1 to 4 would be the first section uh, chapters 1 to 4 may, basically has two incidents the crossing of the jordan river and uh, the rahab story how she helps the uh, spice so 5 to 12 is basically where we have um, the falling of the walls of jericho the defeat which they have at AI because Akan has sinned. I have said these things. So, and we have the um, declaration on the two mountains. Uh, and you have chapters 10, where you have uh, the southern campaign, chapter 11, the northern campaign. So that would be your second section, chapters 5 to 12. So we are, last section was 13 to 24, uh, which I have just mentioned. Um, so maybe we can very briefly look at chapter 3, where you have the people crossing the Jordan River. So this is a test of faith which God places before them. Um, you have the Jordan River uh, kind of dividing the land. And so if you want to go into the promised land, you would have to cross the Jordan River. There are certain portions of the river where the waters are more shallow. And that's basically where the people generally cross. But God tells them very specifically that he wants them to cross in the area which is directly opposite Jericho. And over there, the waters are much higher. Um, uh, the waters are much deeper in that uh, place. And not only that, in that particular area, um, there is also greater chances of flooding of the waters. So when we look at jo Joshua chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, we get to know uh, exactly when these people enter, try to enter the land. Uh, so if maybe we can have someone read out uh, Joshua chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and then we will look at some details regarding this. Uh, Joshua chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, please. Now the Jordan, now the Jordan is at the stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the big city of Zarathan. While the water flow, flowing down to the Sea of Arabath, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. It says in the very first sentence um, in, in, um, of verse 15, Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. So God selects the time. God selects the place. He does not choose an easy time. He does not choose an easy place. He asks them to cross, you know, in the in uh, in that place which is directly opposite Jericho, where generally people do not cross over. That's the place that he chooses. Moreover, at that point of time during the harvest season is when the Jordan is in full flood. The waters are moving very fast. The waters are very deep, and it's it is at this point of uh, in this particular position that God says, "I want you to cross over." So it would not be something easy. They would have to actually uh, you know, exercise their faith. And uh, we see the priests doing that. The priests who are carrying the ark, it says that they confidently go up to the water and they put their feet into the water. And because they have taken this step of faith, once their feet get into the water, the water stops flowing. So um, even though the, uh, the Jordan River at that point of time is in flood stage, the waters 
stop and uh, so we have people um, you know uh, considering what were the factors involved how did this happen in verse 16 it explains to us that all the waters continue to pile up at a town called uh, adam okay in the vicinity of zarethan it says so most probably there would have been some kind of a mudslide now the, what we need to understand about this entire region is that it's a very um, it's a, it's a um, it's an earthquake prone region so you have frequent earthquakes in this entire region and when you have earthquake activity taking place sometimes the river banks you know the the the, the ground the land the mud which is there on either sides of the river bank could get shaken and it can and you could have a mudslide so if that happens and you have all the uh, you know mud sliding into the river at that particular point it leads to a temporary blockage so the water will not be able to flow further so which is probably what happened at uh, this place called adam where god causes the uh, probably god causes a mudslide to build up and so all the waters get stopped over there and the waters are no longer flowing forward and this happens only when the priests step into the water you know down below uh, at this other place where they are entering near jericho where they are entering the minute their feet touch over here god causes a water uh, pile up to take place at a higher location you know because the water is flowing downward uh, so it's not just something which happened due to natural causes it is something which happened directly in response to their act of faith so what do we learn from this our god has control over nature he has control over the weather he has control over all the elements you know so he is completely in charge and how all of these things move and affect and operate depends on our faith if we are living in obedience if we are um, doing whatever god is asking us to do god responds to our faith and he can control these natural elements and make them do whatever they are supposed to do according to his purposes so even though he tells them to enter the waters when the waters are in flood stage something that nobody would do i mean it would be a very um, dangerous thing to do but the people choose to believe the two you know the priests step uh, um, into the waters in faith and the minute they do that the uh, river waters start piling up at another place higher up in uh, in, in a place called adam and uh, so the rest of the water which is there from the point of adam all that water gets drained away and at this place at jericho you have now got dry ground and the people are able to cross over and um, based on the historical records that we have uh, we see that this kind of a thing happened even on certain other occasions um, you no know, according to historical records we see that there was a piling up of water um, in 1267 in 1906 and also in 1927 and the historical records say that in 1927 the mudslide which took place was so severe that the waters got stuck for 21 hours you know which means that the, uh, lower down in the valley all the water would have just got drained down and um, people would probably have actually seen the riverbed you know because for 21 hours the waters get stopped at a higher level uh, so this was something which used to happen geographically in that region but in this particular chapter it happens not just due to natural reasons but directly because of an act of faith which these people choose to you know uh, perform so um, that's regarding the build up of the waters at a place called adam and uh, because of which the people are able to cross over at jericho and enter the promised land um maybe we can also look at another incident uh, which would be the you know uh, the sun standing still and that would be in joshua chapter 10 
maybe we can have someone first read out uh, you know some of the earlier verses uh, okay we we don't have any question here um you know uh, in the chat when you guys paste the verses if there are any questions about that which i have missed out you know if you can just tell me so that i you know in case some student online wants to post a question and i'm unable to see that if you can just tell me if there is a question i you know i will be able to answer that here in the class you just have to put up your hand if you have any question and we can address that all right so uh, joshua chapter 10 if we can have someone read out verses 9 and um, 9 10 and 11 yeah joshua 10 9 10 and 11 So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having been passed off all the night from Gilead, and the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chose them by the way of the oceans of Beth Bethor and struck them as far as. and and mark and mark and as they failed before israel when they were going down the asel and betoron the lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as asel stone from heaven on them as far as asaka and they died there were more who died because of the hailstones that the son of israel killed with his sword all right um just a little background regarding these verses if you remember we saw how the gibeonite people who are part of the amorite nation group they trick Joshua into making a peace treaty with them even though God's original plan was that they should be destroyed so now once the treaty has been done Joshua and his people cannot go back on the treaty they must keep their word so what happens is that the um five kings decide to come and fight against Gibeon and Gibeon immediately makes a demand and says we have entered into a treaty with uh, you israelites now it is your duty to come and help us to defend us against these five kings who are attacking us so joshua and his people cannot say you i mean we you, you people are not israelites we have no obligation towards you they cannot take that stand because they have signed a treaty in the presence of god without consulting him which was the mistake which they did uh, so now they are bound to help and so now joshua and his people have to come and defend the gibeonites against these five kings who have come to attack them so from gilgal the entire night joshua and his people they march and they finally reach gibeon so they must have reached gibeon sometime in the morning early morning is when they have reached this uh, gibeon and there's a huge army waiting for them there are five kings and five kings armies waiting for them and the israelite people are not exactly experienced warriors but here they are you know they have brought themselves into the situation where they now have to defend the gibeonites and uh, so uh, now they are looking to the lord for help and it says in verse 10 um the lord threw them into confusion before israel so joshua and the israelites defeated them completely at gibeon it says that the lord through the five armies into complete confusion so that they were not able to fight against these israelite forces you can imagine the israelite forces would have been smaller in number on the opposite side you have five kings and their armies and yet god throws them into confusion to such an extent that the israelites are able to defeat them how did he throw them into confusion what did the lord do uh we have some uh, suggestions which are made by uh, certain scholars based on some manuscripts which they have you know uh, come across uh, so um 
there are these Mesopotamian religious manuscripts which have been discovered, which talk about the sun standing still, the sun and the moon standing still in the sky. So those have got nothing to do with our Joshua incident, but it's, a, it's basically a superstition which the people of the land had. What was the superstition? The superstition was basically this. 14 days after the full moon, if the sun and the moon appear in the sky at the same time, then according to their belief system, it's a very auspicious day. And on that day, great battles can be won. On the other hand, if the sun and the moon are, are seen in the sky on the 15th day after the full moon, then there can be great disaster. And in fact, this is the wording which they have in, the, you know, in one of those Mesopotamian ma manuscripts. It says, um, so uh, 14th day since the last full moon, you know, if the sun and moon are standing still in the sky, the land will be satisfied, good things will happen. On the other hand, when the moon and sun are seen with each other on the 15th day, a powerful enemy will raise his weapons against the land. That was their superstition. So the suggestion, the theory which some scholars have made is that maybe that's the reason why Joshua, you know, requests the Lord to give these pagan you know, kings, these five kings, a sign and show them who is the living God. So um, sometime around morning is when they would have, you know, after traveling the entire night, they would have reached Gibeon sometime in the morning. And then probably Joshua cries out to the Lord and says, Lord, could you slow down the progress of the sun so that the moon will still be visible in the sky? And probably that was the there's an inauspicious day for those five kings. You know, so when they see this sign in the sky, it must have thrown them into confusion. It must have caused them to panic because you know they believed in those superstitions and those omens. Uh, so this again is just a theory, but um, you know uh, it's based on manuscripts which they have found, uh, which talk about the superstitions which these people had in those uh, days. So we see this happening sometimes, you know, uh, the sun comes out, daylight comes, but you can still see a little bit of the moon in the sky. I mean, you must have seen that. We've all seen that, right? So this is what has occurred over here. Joshua, but for us in our case, the moon disappears. You know, by the time the, the, the sunlight starts brightening more and more, we don't see the moon anymore. But on this particular occasion, uh, God responds to Joshua and slows down the progress of the daylight to such an extent that the moon continues being seen for many, many hours. This is what it says um, uh, in verse 17, 10, 17. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. So in our case, we see it for happening for maybe at the most half an hour, 15, 20 minutes, you know, where we can still see the moon in the sky and the daylight has already come. But here, uh, for many, many hours, uh, the people continue to see the sun and the moon both together in the sky. And that would have been a very, very bad superstition uh, for these, you know, pagan kings. Uh, so maybe the Lord threw them into confusion using this kind of a um, strategy is what some, it's a, it's a theory which some scholars put forward. Um, so uh, whatever may be the reason, uh, you know, we do know that God hears Joshua's cry and God allows the daylight to slow down so that the moon will continue being, you know, visible in the sky for many, many hours. Uh, so that's just some details regarding that. We can uh, maybe also... No, that's all right. Yeah. So maybe we can quickly move into the book of Judges. Um, so in the book of Judges, we see that now the people have settled in the land. Um, they have failed to conquer all the territories which God asked them to conquer, just basically due to lack of faith. You know, they did not have the courage to conquer all the places that God had asked them to take over. And because of that, the locals are still living uh, in many of the territories. And uh, so they begin to, um, you know, fight with the Israelites. So in the book of Judges, we see that whenever the people are living in sin, God allows these local nations 
to conquer them to make them captive you know to uh, to attack them and defeat them on the other hand whenever the people choose to be faithful to the lord the lord makes sure that they have victory so in the book of judges every time the people fall into sin and you have the local nations coming and controlling them then the people cry out to god and say lord please deliver us and god raises a judge for them um why is the term judge being used over there these judges did not sit in a law court and give out justice they, they were not judges in that sense they were judges in the sense that they brought god's judgment upon those local nations which were uh, you know uh, controlling the uh, israelites at that particular point of time so each of the judges which god raised up these were people who brought god's judgment upon the local nations which were holding the israelite people in bondage so um, let's just look very briefly at the structure of the book of judges uh, so um, chapter 1 chapter 2 and in chapter 3 up to verse 6 is basically where you have the introduction so chapter 1 up to chapter 3 verse 6 is where uh you could say that's the introductory section where it talks about how uh, you know they had failed to conquer all the places that they were supposed to so as a result of that every time they sinned the local people would take over take control of them and they would be brought into subjugation so this was happening to them repeatedly so we have the uh, introduction in in this uh two and a half chapters then chapter 3 verse 7 onwards we have the judges one after another being mentioned so the second section will be chapter 3 verses 7 to 16 um where you have you uh, know the judges being introduced totally in the book of judges there are 14 judges mentioned it's not necessary that only after one judge died the next judge would have risen to power at certain points of time it's possible that two judges would have been um helping the israelites in two different locations okay so because otherwise the timeline doesn't work out uh, so there, there were probably some times during which you would have two judges uh, you know uh, operating under the lord in two different locations in that entire land of israel uh so totally there were 14 judges so um so the second section can be can be judges chapter 3 verse 7 all the way up to chapter 16 so 3 7 up to chapter 16 can be the second section because you have all these 14 judges being described and what they did how they helped and then the last section would be chapter 17 to 21 where some examples are given about how terribly the people backslid uh the the terrible immoral condition of the people is described how they went so far away from the lord that um you know um, there was no there was there was no no moral control over them any longer so some some terrible examples of the things which they did are given in chapter 17 to 21 um and we especially see the tribes of dan and benjamin uh, which are probably the most sinful the worst among all the tribes so some of their terrible stories are mentioned in, in chapter 17 to 21 so this could be the three main sections of uh, the book of judges let's look at something um, interesting that's mentioned over here uh, not interesting in the sense of you know it being a story but something important that we can learn a learning which we maybe can take away judges chapter 2 verses 7 to 11 what does it say about the people and why does it say that these people had become so sinful judges chapter 2 verses 7 to 11 if someone can read out we will understand how the nation you know which was supposed to be which stood on the two mountains of ebal and gerizim and declared and said yes we will follow the lord what happened to them how did they end up in such a horrible condition that they do the terrible things which are described in chapters 17 to 21 how did they come to this terrible condition um 
So if someone can read out for us, Judges chapter 2, verses 7 to 11, please. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnath, Timnath Heris, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount, Mount Gash. When all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baal. When we were covering the book of Deuteronomy and the law was repeated again for this new generation for a second time, repeatedly, again and again in the book of Deuteronomy, it was told, teach your children these things. Let them know what the laws of the Lord are. And we see that these people were deaf. They did not bother to listen to, uh, to the advice which had been given to them. They did not bother to educate their children about Yahweh and his ways which is why it says over here, it's shocking. It says in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it says, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. What is wrong with these people? I mean, they had that generation, that second generation, which saw the older generation die in the wilderness. And, you know, God wiped out every single one of them, uh, except, of course, for Joshua and Caleb. And... Um, so they had seen the judgment of God, the wrath of God, and now God was giving this new generation a chance to enter into the land. And the one piece of advice given to them was, kindly start educating your children so that they will continue to walk in the ways of God. And they had not bothered doing that. It says here in verse 10 of Judges chapter 2, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done. Why didn't they not even why did they not even bother training their children in the things of God? And we see the same thing happen in this current generation today. People are so interested in the studies of their children, in their careers, in their future, in making money, in earning power. They are not educating their children in the things of God. Priorities being given to everything else except the things of God. If this continues, a generation which which will grow up which will neither know the Lord nor his ways. You know, it's dangerous ground. Studies, educating our children is important. Um, you know, uh, joining them in a hundred different courses uh, in the evening, that is also fine. But let there be time for them to learn the things of God, to love the things of God, to, to, to get passionate about the things of God. And that will not happen by just sending them, you know, to children's church for one hour. That's a training that has to be done in the home by the father and the mother, or otherwise, Judges 2.10 can happen to this generation, this younger generation which is growing up. So it's a very serious thing. So the reason that in the book of Judges we see the people falling into such terrible sin and doing the horrible things which they did, you know, in chapters 17 to 21, those terrible stories that we see over there, all that happened because their parents did not bother to educate them, you know, spiritually. They were not nurtured spiritually. And the book of Judges is the result of that recklessness of the parents in not bringing up their children. In the, so priorities matter. It is very important for us to, you know, um, um, educate our children and join them in a hundred extracurricular courses. But leave them enough time to dwell on the things of God, start enjoying the things of God, developing a love for the Lord, those things take time. Are we leaving them enough time to, you know, grow in those things? Or do they have no spare time left at all? So that finally, when they get a little bit of spare time, all they want to do is sit with their phone and entertain themselves. Are we creating enough space and time for them to learn the things of God and start enjoying those things? That is so vital, so important. So that's one very important learning that comes across to us from this book of Judges. Um, let's look at one uh, sinful thing which the tribe of Dan does. 
in Judges chapter 18. And um, the Lord does not approve of this. Like we have already talked about, you know, again and again in Deuteronomy 7 verses 1 and 2, very clearly the Lord says, there are seven nations against whom I want to bring judgment. So you are going to defeat those seven nations. You're going to occupy their territories and settle down in their areas only. God did not grant them permission to attack the other nation groups, which may be, you know, in that area. Very clearly the Lord says whom they should attack. Because this is not just um, um, war. This is divine judgment that God is bringing upon certain people and only those people should be attacked and wiped out, not the others. But this is what happens with Dan. Dan, you know, uh, this tribe of Dan has been living in sin. So um, they do not bother to follow the ways of the Lord as a result of which, you know, they are unable to conquer the territory given to them. Uh, this is what we see about them in Judges chapter 1, verses 34 to 35. Um, it says in Judges chapter 1, 34 to 35, that, yeah, maybe you can read out that. If, someone, if we can have someone read out for us, Judges chapter 1, 34 to 35. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not allow them to come down to the velo. And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Hayes in Ejalon and Salvim. Yet when the strength of the house of Joseph became greater, they were put under tribute. It says over here that, the, that these people um, of the tribe of Dan were not able to defeat the Amorites who were in that region. The region which God had promised them and given to them, they were unable to conquer the territory given to them. Why? Because they were living in sin. We see that explained in Judges chapter 13, verse 1, where it says that God gave them into the hands of the you know, enemy because they were not following his ways. So, the reason the tribe of Dan was unable to take over the territory, the inheritance which was given to them, is because of their own sinfulness. Because of their sinfulness, God's powerful backing was not there. His strength was not there because they were living in sin. They had chosen to separate themselves from the living God through their conduct. As a result of that, they found themselves in a very difficult position. You know, they are a large tribe so many families each family has got so many members and they will have their you know servants and their slaves they will have their cattle but they don't have a territory to live in they don't have a territory to live in because they have been living in sin and they have been unable to defeat the enemy so what has happened to them is that on one side you have the amorites and the philistines fully in control and on the other side you have the tribe of judah and they are stuck in between in one small piece of territory and they're unable to survive because there are so many of them and there's not enough place. So now, what would be the simple reason? I mean, what would, what would be the simple solution to this problem? Get down on your knees, repent and say, Lord, we have been foolish. But now, Lord, we want to come back to you. And so if we repent and come back to you, then you will fight for us, Lord. And we will be able to defeat these Amorites and the Philistines. That would have been the right attitude. But no. Dan has become so hardened in their hearts that they come up with another scheme. They say, let's look around for other territories. There must be some group of people somewhere whom we can you know, uh, defeat and we can take over their land without God's permission. God's permission has been given only against these seven nation groups and their territory. So we in uh, Judges chapter 18, we see that they send out spies. To look out to you know to go through the entire land and find areas which are unprotected which they can take over without god's permission and so the people go around their spies go around they come to a place um, called laish and the people of laish uh, are living in peace and they uh, that area is very prosperous and god's judgment has not been declared against them 
these people have no right to go and touch them or conquer them but you know we see uh, dan doing that they go to these people who are in laish and um, laish is basically under the control of the sidonians who stay very far away so by the time the sidonians are able to come and provide help to the uh, to the people in laish it's too late the, so you have the tribe of dan going over there taking over that region and renaming it after themselves as the land of dan that's the name which they gave give to that place and they take over that place and they have done it without the lord's permission or covering what they have done is detestable in the eyes of god they killed a people group whom god had not yet considered ripe for judgment so this was just human war this was not divine judgment this was just human war being fought for selfish reasons so in you know they were no different from the nations that we have today you know who who take up war against other nations just for the sake of selfish political reasons and so we see dan doing that uh, in the book of judges chapter 8 um, chapter 18 and this is not something that the lord was pleased with um maybe we can uh, very briefly look at also chapter 4 uh, which talks about the story of debora um and barak now as we don't have time you know uh, just to very briefly outline it um barak is the judge who is supposed to deliver the people from the hands of the king of canaan and he does not have the courage to do that debora the prophetess goes to him and says the lord has promised that you know he is going to um, you know attack these canaanites near the kishon river so all you need to do is take your army go up to the kishon river their god will take care of the enemy you know and bring them into your hand and you all you have to do is kill them that's all you have to do but barak does not have the guts to do that because he finds out that there's going to be an army of 900 chariots waiting for him over there near the river kishon okay so these are chariots which have been fitted with iron which means they are faster they are stronger uh, the soldiers who will be shooting arrows from the chariots will be you know more um, in a in a safer position so he is not he doesn't have the guts to go over there and face those 900 chariots even though god has promised and said that he will hand over the enemy to them at the river kishon and um, so um, you know debora says because uh, you're hesitating and you're saying come with me if you come with me then i'll go otherwise i don't have the guts to go like as if debora is you know god almighty she's just a prophetess but he chooses to place his faith in debora rather than in the almighty god and so debora says to him yes god will give you the victory but you no honor will come to you from that because you're putting your faith in me not in the almighty one who has made a promise that he will deliver the enemy into your hands and so they actually go over there uh, well i think your um, break time is going to kind of your bell is going to ring any minute now but anyway they go up to the kishon river and um, um, there is a flood which takes place we see that in chapter 5 in judges chapter 5 as a god makes a flood happen you know at that river again the same story which happened with the jordan river incident you have waters piling up at some earlier you know at a higher location um, uh, so that mud slide must have suddenly released and so you have the entire waters flooding and coming down to this kishon into this area where uh, barak is supposed to come and because of the flash flood which takes place over there those iron chariots get stuck in the mud and uh, the enemy is defeated uh so um so barak uh, is able to defeat the enemy but god does not honor his name because he did not trust the lord uh, that the lord would do that for them so those things are mentioned in your chapters 4 and 5 so yeah you can go ahead for your break and then uh, when we come back um we will look at a few more details yeah